Divine Truth Book Group. These are discussions of books selected by Jesus and Mary. This book group discusses Through the Mists by Ephra and Robert James Lees. This is Chapter 21, Home, Part 2. The discussion was held on the 24th of June, 2014, in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our final part, our final discussion of the book Through the Mists. We're discussing today the second half of the last chapter, chapter 21. And I have with me again, Jesus. We're going to talk through Thanks, the babe. various things. Hello, everyone. How are you? <laughs> now, it is our last chapter, but we have new equipment today. So hopefully we're not going to have to stop for technical glitches. But if we do, we have fine editing, a fine editing team here and they'll probably uh, edit it out. So you don't even know it happened, <laughs> but it might. <laughs> so and Jesus has just been working on getting it all sorted out all morning mm. with uh, Lena and Igor. So he's just uh, had to take a moment to pause and actually think about the book <laughs> shake myself up and get myself in their head <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> so look i hope you enjoy our final discussion i have certainly enjoyed this whole process of presenting a book group and yeah. i've certainly learned a lot not just about um frederick and his journey <laughs> through the mist but also about myself so i hope that you enjoy our final offering <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good day. So, if you remember, mm -hmm. um, where Fred is actually on his journey to his new home, he doesn't know that yet, mm. and he's just been he's just been to see the home of Mahani. Yes. And um, and Omra off in the distance, and he found that quite overwhelming. Yeah. And Mahani talked to him about some really important lessons and reflections. Yeah, very good. In, in fact, if anything, it was like a summary of the book in terms of lessons, wasn't it? It was. And uh, and now it's just like, what's going to happen next for him in his day-to-day -day life? Yeah. yeah. And I suppose that's the, the thing I find really beautiful about this second half of the chapter mm. is that suddenly Fred, even though he's been reflecting on many things all the way through his journey uh, and thinking about his earth life, all of a sudden he starts to think about himself mm. and what's going to happen to him and where he might be and it's sort of it's sort of really lovely because before now he's been thinking about everyone else so much hasn't he he's been thinking i want to go yeah. back and share this truth not only thinking of everyone else but i feel he's been so fascinated by all the new discoveries that he hasn't really had any time to think about well what's my life going to be in my day-to-day -day life if you like going to be like he, he's been so interested in all the new things that he's found out and also he's been well looked after because of this very strong curious desire that he's had inside of himself obviously the spirit friends that he has have been allowing him to exercise this desire as much as they are and able to allow it to occur and also yeah. to feed it yeah and so it's it's only now um, and we'll find out how long that yeah. is after his arrival in spirit world that he starts contemplating where am i going to live and what what's my life going to look like and you know who who am i going to be with what's what's the town or city that i'm going to live in look like and things like that he's never really contemplated those questions before no. and that's lovely quality uh of his soul isn't it just yeah. to become so enthralled and just allowing that desire to know and to learn to overwhelm him so much that he doesn't even really yeah. pause and you see that a lot in children don't you where they're just um so engrossed in learning that they're not really thinking much about themselves. That's right. Yeah, yeah. he's yeah. exactly like that, isn't yeah. he? Yeah. So I said he, in the first um, few paragraphs from where we've left off, mm -hmm. Fred really asks three really important questions, doesn't yeah. he? he? Yeah. He says, how long have I been here in this life? <laughs> so question number one. Question number one. Why have I learned so much? Question number two. And question number three is, where's my home? Where's my yes. home going to be? Which is a natural question. It is. Mm. So let's start with the first question. Yes. Um, which is really fascinating in itself, the answer. Certainly. So he says, how long have I been here in this life? And Mahanin replies, only a few weeks according to the computation of Earth. Mm. 
So there you go. There's a, like, so the whole book covers a few weeks in, in terms of time period. And if you think about the wealth of experience and learning that he has encountered in that time, mm. really, to me, it's kind of it's something I reflected on reading that, that sentence was, wow, a few weeks in life and you can have that much rich experience and learning. How often do we engage that here on earth? Mm. Often a few weeks go by and hardly anything changes and we don't learn anything new. And, yes. um, life. and the reality is we could learn that much on earth. Like the, yeah. the, the earth life is just as pregnant with illustrations of truth, if you like, exactly. as the spirit life is. But, but most of us have a very, very strong aversion to receiving new truth mm -hmm. and also a very strong aversion to discovery of new things. And we, we spend a lot of times focusing our attention just into or honing our attention, I suppose you could say, into just a certain area of interest that we have. And as a result, we are very, very close to finding out truths in all the different areas that we could discover them. Yeah. And, and also, because of much of our life on Earth is governed towards you know, eating, drinking, having to go to the toilet, <laughs> you know, um, having to sleep you know, these yeah. eight hours and so forth. You, and then, of course, we are also governed towards things like having to, because of the way in which our life on Earth is governed, at the moment, in, in the error-based way in which is governed at the moment, we have to earn money to live, many mm -hmm. of us. So, so what that means is we spend a good 40 or 50 hours of our week doing that, and then we spend another good 40 or 50 hours a week doing the eating, drinking, going to the toilet, having a shower, you know, <laughs> sleeping part of our week. And, and of course, it, it does limit the amount of time that we actually do have available to us to experiment with life and, and discover new things. And then on top of that, because we are so tired generally, after doing all of those other things, <laughs> the time that we have available um, at the other period of time the left energy, over, yeah. the, the, the energy and time we yeah. have left over, we basically feel like we just want to spend it for ourselves or we just want to have some fun or whatever just it is. chill out from all the hectic exactly. stuff. Exactly. And so, so after you've taken all of that time out of our lives, generally there's very, very little time that we spend discovering new things. Mm. Mm -hmm. Whereas those, all of those limitations are not present in the spirit world. In the world. spirit world, mm. yeah. There's also a lot to be said, isn't there, for having a job in which you can explore your passions and, of and discover new things about God. I mean, I feel like we're always able to discover new things about the way the universe operates, no matter what we're doing, yes. um, as long as we're reflective and humble. Yeah. But um, there's a lot to be said for having a job that you're really passionate about, isn't there? Yeah, true. And living with someone who you find really interesting. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Challenging. Yeah, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. But also I feel too there's this other issue that we face on earth a lot of the times, and that is that we, we sort of have this we're not really that interested in things. Yeah. We, 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 we don't have a strong interest in a lot of things. Like at home, I've got so many different interests that it's impossible for me to contemplate being bored at any point in time. <laughs> yeah. and, and yet a lot of people are bored with their lives because they, they only have one or a couple of interests and, or they have their work and a couple of interests outside of work perhaps. But, but they're not interested in everything. Mm. And, and as you grow and change, you, you find you become more and more interested in every single thing that you can think of. And, and that is a natural thing to do, which is something that Fred has yes. done in the spirit yeah. world too. He was interested not in just one area of things, but lots of different things. Yeah. Something I feel about that, about, you know, I see how fascinated and interested you are in many things. And I would have said that I'm really fascinated and interested in a lot of things as well. But the difference that I see is that you're really engaged in actual experimentation with the things that fascinate you. Mm. And for myself, I've, it's only recently that I've decided oh, I'm going to experiment with that thing. I started fermenting vegetables in our kitchen rather than just talking about it and reading about it. Yeah. Yeah. The difference between just um, do, like learning about something and doing it is often there's a big relationship with fear and facade in, yes. those, in that, um, isn't there? And yes. that, that's why I think that largely 
the majority of people on the planet aren't that interested in things because they're attached no. to a facade and they're afraid of mistakes and yep. failure and all those kinds of things. Yeah, or they've become so exhausted from their day-to-day -day life that they're too tired or they believe they're too tired to engage anything that they would feel passionate about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so in the end, they spend very few hours a week, if any at all, Yeah doing what Fred did for, you could say, 192 hours of the week, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is, which is the, you know, he spent the entire period of time learning. Yeah. And when you think about that many hours available to you, there's quite a lot of hours available to us for learning. Mm -hmm. and, and if we have that attitude that we're going to learn because we want to discover everything and learn yeah. how to do everything, yeah. then, of course, we'll be fascinated by everything that we choose to do. Yeah. Yeah. And Fred, as Fred really wanted to emphasize to us a few chapters back over a couple of chapters, even when we're asleep, we can be learning. Of course. And so, yeah, um, yeah there yeah. really doesn't need to be an hour wasted, yeah. does there? I also feel another problem that we have on Earth is that we spend a lot of time trying to get our addictions met. So, yeah. and, and many people spend all of their time getting their addictions met, you know, and I feel that this is also a major problem or a major impediment to learning because addictions don't actually do anything to help you learn. What they do is they just feed a certain condition that you have that you can't, that, uh, that, uh, that's suppressing fear. Yeah. So, so in the end, what, what you're really doing by feeding your addictions is suppressing your fears mm -hmm. and all of your fears suppress desires. Mm -hmm. So of course, you're not probably going to learn much new if you just spend most of your time looking after your emotional or physical addictions. Yeah, mm. yeah, mm. absolutely. Okay, so, so that was question the one. first question, how long has he been here? A few weeks. <laughs> and then he says beautifully to him, why are you tired? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, Frederick replies that he doesn't think he'll be tired ever again, no. which is yeah. because he'd visited the home of rest. And, yeah. and then Mahanin asks him, and I love the way this question plays out as well. Yeah. Why, uh, why have you learned so much? He said. That is a question you could best answer, I replied. <laughs> <laughs> it is simply because you have asked so much. Yeah. And just those three lines, I find that really beautiful. Uh, why have I learned so much? Because you've asked so much. Yeah. Um, can, I, can I talk though a little bit, not only has he asked so much, the attitude with which he's asked yeah. has been completely different than most of the attitudes that you get questions here on earth. So on earth, most questions are driven by doubt, fear, anger or some other emotion that's quite in opposition to learning. Yeah. Whereas with Fred, when he, when he asked questions, he was very, he was curious and he was open to receiving the answer. He didn't argue about the answer. Mm. Uh, this is something we find a lot in our day to day life where people ask us a question, we give them an answer, and then they want to fight you or argue with mm -hmm. you on the, about the answer. Mm -hmm. And this is because it's all the, the question originally was driven by impure motives. It's not driven by an open and curious desire to know the answer. Yeah. It's driven by all sorts of fears and addictions and other motivations. Definitely. And this is another thing thing that I feel is the main problem with people on earth with learning because every time you ask a question when really what you're trying to do is make a statement, you'd be better off making a statement and then going on your way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, you know, like asking a question only to get an answer and then to argue about it. All that does is actually waste a lot of people's time and also waste very much the time of the person you've asked the question. Yeah. It's not a very loving process to engage. Whereas Freddie engaged a more loving process, which is a very curious desire to know the answers and to reflect upon and see the personal import of each answer. Yeah. So he, he was always looking at, okay, how does that affect me? How does mm. that affect my life? How is that impacted upon my choices and decisions, whether I was, when I was on earth and now in the spirit world? Yeah. And how does that, how, what do I learn from that with regard to my relationship with God, my relationship with other people? He was always quite self-reflective. He, and he didn't argue all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like, and, and I find that now, I, whenever people ask us a whole series of questions, but it's all just argumentative, my feelings are, yeah, go and argue with someone else. I don't want to spend <laughs> my time arguing with you. I just, if you've got a sincere desire to know the question or the answer to the question, then I'll, I'll answer it. But, but there's really no point in answering questions where people just want to be argumentative. Mm. 
Absolutely. Yeah, we can ask questions in a lot of different, with a lot of different motivations, yeah. say, because yeah. we want to argue, prove a point. Sometimes we can ask questions because we want to appear silly to placate an addiction yeah. in another person. Yeah. Uh, we can ask because we, like you said, we, we're afraid, really. Or well, we, we have doubts and we want reassurance. And that's not a valid, it's not a sincere question then either. You know, asking questions because you have doubts is not a, a real question. A, que a person who answers a real, que a real question is like a child in the sense that they really want to know the answer to that question and they are open to any answer at yeah. that point as long as the answer can be validated or proven in some way mm. or supported by logic. And, and most people on earth are not asking questions for that, for any of those reasons. Yeah. And that's why most people who pass from this earth never have the experience that Fred has, yep. where he had a whole series of very well-developed spirits come to his aid, answering the questions one after the other, after the other, uh, you know, and he's meeting one after the other, after the other of the, of the people wanting to do this. And because it was completely driven by his own really pure, passionate desire, desire to know the truth, no matter what the cost, even if it was a personal fear, you know, if it was a feeling inside of him where, oh, I've got to change something now. He wasn't avoiding any of that. He, he just wanted to know the answer to the questions. Yeah, it seems to me that in order to really receive an answer to a question, we have to have the acknowledgement inside of us that we don't know already. Mm. And most people don't on earth that already have such a long set of preconceived ideas Correct. when they ask a question it's, it's like there's loaded. no openness yeah. in their heart there's no saying i don't really know they're saying no. i really think this but yeah. what do you think yeah and that's not really a question is it no not really like i said most people would be better off making statements and going on their way yeah yeah <laughs> because because most people are not really asking questions they're just making statements couched as questions yeah and that that's not a that's not an open curious desire of the soul to know the answers yeah. that's driven by a desire of the soul to prove that they're right and everybody else is wrong or whatever it is they want it well, even, sort of yeah wonderful. even sometimes it's just that there's so much preconception inside isn't there that that there's a fear of letting go of or a fear of yeah i, I do don't you think? yeah i feel there is a fear yeah. obviously deep fears you know yeah. like deep fears about letting go of things this is why you see on our on recordings you, you you see recordings over the last five or six years you have the same people asking me the same question in a different seminar yeah. now why do they do that because they want a different answer yeah. it's not about it there's no innocence in it i mm -hmm. feel they just want a different answer and they don't, didn't like the answer they got the last time. <laughs> and, and if Fred took that approach, he would not have ever had the two week experience that he had when he, he first had. passed. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, he would have done that with one of one person, the very first person he met, you know, when he, after he passed over the mess and after that they would have said, yeah, you go on your way <laughs> yeah, and you're right. by yourself, okay. we're not going yeah. to spend any more time with you. And Because and yeah, I can see it's a waste of it's time. It's a waste okay. of time yeah. spending time with people like that. Yeah, yeah, it is. You know, you want to spend, if you if you do know the answers to questions, and other people don't you want to spend time with the people who really want to know mm -hmm. that's what you really want to do yeah. and and this is why everything should this is why with god everything's driven by desire if you really want to know the answer to the question god will always provide you an answer to the question but most of us are most of us are not sincere. We don't really want to know. We want to be able to tell God that he's wrong or we want to tell somebody else they're wrong or we want to hold on to our own concepts and beliefs and we don't want to change. And under those circumstances, we don't have a pure, sincere desire to know the truth. Mm -hmm. And under those circumstances, why would anybody come along and give us the truth? Yeah. Like It's all too hard to do that. <laughs> yeah. All you want to do is walk away from those people and go to somebody <laughs> who, who basically find, who is easier to deal with, who, who does want some assistance and desires it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So Fred really had this feeling inside of him that he wanted to know the answer. He, he acknowledged mm. he didn't know the answer and he wanted to know it. And Mahanin goes on to basically say that he'd been asking all his life. Fred had been asking mm. these questions all his life and it was such a developed question or set of questions inside of him that yes. when he arrived, suddenly there was people who could give him the answers. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think that's really beautiful that Mahanin is also saying to him, you are asking this 
of us all this time and now we can tell you. Yes. And, uh, um, so, yeah, I, I love the way he's developed that really sincere desire on earth as well. Yeah. To now he so, finally yeah, has Yeah, it's wonderful, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Okay. So then the third question. So then the third question is, yeah. where is my home? Yes. Uh, so he said, he says, home, I repeated, did you hear my wish then <laughs> as I stood upon the hill? I've been so interested that I had not given one thought to this until I was looking upon yours, yeah. which made me wonder what distance would lie between the two. Was my thought a premonition of what was coming next? Yeah. 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 And so... Mahanin says, perhaps it was, come and see. Yeah. And so they set out on this journey. And really what happens is, unbeknownst to Fred, there's a gathering of, of people occurring mm -hmm. um, for his homecoming. So he's witnessed all these beautiful celebrations at different ver various, the chorale, and then in just a few chapters ago where he saw the people passing mm -hmm. into a higher, higher sphere. Um, but he has no thought that that would be happening for him. No. But they just bump into all these people along the way. Yes. Yeah, so, so you could, if you set the scene more, uh, probably accurately, it's like walking over a hill. Oh, there's some new people that you meet. <laughs> and there's another scene there. And then you walk over another hill and there's a new scene there. And there's some more people that you meet. <laughs> and, and they and, all join. And they all sort of join up with you. But, but actually, they don't leave you. They don't go on their merry way. They, they're following along with you and talking with you and things like that while you're walking over. Yeah. And seeing all these new scenes, and obviously, um, initially, it's, it's like, oh, this is a really wonderful experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and like it says, it passes from one glen to another, and yes. one view to another, and, and it comes across Kushner and Avrez and several other friends yeah. who, who they, he didn't even know, and then, and then he continued to, you know, linger, yeah, and have a ch chat there with those people, and then walk a bit further, and. And some more people join up. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, so, and so he says, other additions were constantly being made to our numbers. Many of the friends bring instruments, yeah. others wreathed in flowers, as I had seen them in the festival, until we became the central objects in a long procession, joyful and exultant in the songs they sang to welcome my companion, whom I could not wonder they loved so well. <laughs> so he's thinking they're welcoming my Hanin, all these people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's really beautiful, his... Um, innocence, innocence yeah. in this, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then they begin to come, uh, they come upon sort of a city or a yeah. settlement. Yeah. And uh, Frederick says something really interesting here about the buildings, that they were, they were all very beautiful and they looked like alabaster, I think he says. Um, but the comment he makes was that... Um, they were surrounded by grounds of considerable extent, which in their arrangement displayed the varied tastes and designs of their residents. Mm. But the whole completed such a perfectly harmonious picture that my Hanin's ideal of the ultimate harmony of differences spontaneously flashed upon my mind. Mm. So this is a demonstration of what they were talking about. I think it was earlier in this chapter or at the end of last chapter about... Yeah. Uh, we can all have our differences, but create a harmony together. Yeah. 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 So they continue on. And um, as they're looking at this scene, there's... But there's so many things even in there that he notices, isn't it? Go ahead. Like one of the Go things ahead. he noticed is that, that, that it seems like the houses match the people. Yes. And, and this is, of course, purposefully designed in that everything that we do, there's a record of everything that we've done on Earth. And, uh, and that record is actually, and even while we're on Earth, we are actually automatically building the home we're going to live in mm -hmm. the spirit world. So if we're, if we're already engaged in unloving behaviour when we're on Earth, then obviously our, our spirit home is going to reflect the unloving behaviour we have prior engaged. Yes. And... And if we've engaged loving behaviour on earth, then our spirit home will reflect that as well. Yeah. And for most people, there's a mixture. There's yeah. times when they were unloving and in the addictions and whatever. And there's other times when they were purely loving, you know, had a pure desire to be loving. And there will be a mixture of all of those things. Yeah. And as we go on in the chapter, as Fred comes to his home, he gives some beautiful illustration of that, actually. Yes. So yeah. let's so we'll talk that. about that when we yeah. get there. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so now there's a chiming of bells. Yeah. 
Um, and all of these people that Frederick has known on Earth, beginning with Helen, who, who greeted him when he first crossed the mists, um, come out to, to see him. Mm. And um, some of them were persons to whom I had been sent by that mysterious influence yeah. of which I had spoken and that I could never understand. So that's a reference to um, a little while ago in the book when Fred was talking about his sleep state experience mm. and how he'd been prompted in the sleep state to assist certain people on earth. And mm. he, it was always this mysterious feeling he had to, to go and help this person or that. And yeah. many people thought he was a bit crazy. Yeah. 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 Um, yep. Uh, where I just want to continue reading yeah, from Some there. that I had helped by reading to them, yep. while other, to others I had been of service in other ways. With some I had talked and tried to solve their doubts, endeavouring to reconcile their painful surroundings with the consistency of a God of love. To others I had attempted to explain my vague ideas of heaven, or sought to give them some little solace by expounding my hazy theology. The recognition of more than one brought to my memory, a forgotten promise we had made to meet each other beyond the river, to which they were true of purpose, while I could only claim to be so by accident. <laughs> so there he's saying, well, we said we'd meet after death and they are coming to do it. I just did it by accident. <laughs> exactly. I'm just here. I didn't think of them when I first passed. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's probably a fairly common experience, I feel, when people pass, the passings we have observed. Most of the people are so, you know, I suppose, engaged in their own process that mm -hmm. they don't think oh, of all the promises they made to meet up with that person and meet up with that person after, <laughs> after, after they'd they passed. passed. It's only after some time has gone past generally in the spirit world that they start them. oh, where's that person or where's this person? And that only happens generally when their own pain has diminished to a, yeah. a, a, a large enough degree to, for them to not be self-absorbed in their own pain. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And f in this next paragraph, Fred realises, he thinks, wow, I recognise all of you, but I didn't realise there were so many of you, yeah. which is quite, um, well, that, that has relevance to what is said next to, to yes. Fred. Yes. So he's, he's done a lot of things that he hadn't really given much consideration to. Yeah, correct. Um, and, um, and so now the ceremony is really starting, isn't it? There's music and... Well, it's been going on for some yes. time, but he just didn't... <laughs> he recognised <laughs> it just didn't know. <laughs> but now, now he starts to come to terms with the fact, ah, there's it's something going on here. And why is it that I know everybody? <laughs> <laughs> or it seems yeah. to be that I know most of the people here. Mm. Yeah, and there's music. And, and he turns very emotional to my Hanin. He says, is this, really for, is this really for me? Yeah. Yeah, and my Hanin says, yes, this is, this is where your home is going to be. Yes, yeah. and all the way along through the walk, as it points out, my Hanin had been you know, sending thoughts, oh, we're ready for the next flight, yep. we're ready for the next flight, yep. we're ready for the next flight. It was a carefully orchestrated process to help Fred come to the realisations that he's coming to while he's walking towards his home. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is really what's been happening to him all the way through yes. the book, hasn't it? Yeah different things happening upon him, not really by accident, all orchestrated yeah. by these people who are trying to help him. And I think we need to say here that actually anybody who passes, no matter what their condition, the spirit world is governed in such a way that there is as much attempt to orchestrate as much as possible to assist the person come to full recollections of new information. Yeah. And, and that, that applies whether the person is in the hells or not. It's just when they're in the hells, they're in their own pain so much that they very rarely notice any of these events going on externally. Mm -hmm. But, but, but in, my, in uh, Afra's case, he's now you know, in the top of the first sphere. He, he's, he's, a lot of his pain of the old life has dissipated because yeah. it was related to his old life rather than his new one. And because of his condition of love that he was in, there's not a huge amount of personal pain that he feels. And as a result, he's able to actually hear and see what's going on. Yeah. Whereas many people who pass aren't able to hear or see yeah. what's going on for their benefit. Yeah, and Frederick was not really attached to his earth life as much no. as the majority, the majority of people, of people yeah. are. Yeah. So he... he um, and the majority of people are so him. attached, don't they, that they might spend hundreds of years earthbound yeah, before, before they even get to the spirit world yeah. and experience anything there. 
which is sad in, in a lot of ways because the, the things they could be experiencing there could give them a lot more information about life and a lot more information about what the reasons for their experiences and so forth. Yeah. And something that I think is really poorly understood is when a, when a person passes and they decide that they're not going through the mists, if you like, if they, they're, they're going to remain earthbound, is that they are still in the process of accruing soul damage. Correct. So yeah. actually their position in the spirit world is worsening. If they continue yes. to be engaged in addictions and, and negative things, then it's only getting worse. And um, you could say it's indeterminate. Like they, they, there is no, because they have not yet finalised the actions yes. that they've taken or taking on earth to damage other people, of course the, the house that's being built for them in the spirit world where they'll eventually live obviously has to change its location yes. as yes. they either degrade or improve their condition. Now, exactly. For most, when they first pass, they have a tendency to continue to degrade their condition. Yeah, and that's quite the opposite, isn't it, to a lot of traditional um, beliefs on earth which say that when you pass, that's the judgment moment. Yes. And really, the, it's really not like that for two reasons. One no. is there's no final judgment that decides where you're going to be forever, no. as we know, we've discussed many times through the book, yeah. we can continue to grow and develop. But also, we still have free will choice as to whether we're going to go and face the music, as it were, mm -hmm. or if we're just going to keep avoiding, which, and in our avoidance, that actually degrades us further. Yes. So the, the sooner we um, face the music or face our own soul condition, the better yes. and we don't need to wait till we pass we no. can do it right now no. yeah and in fact it is a hard process to truly face yourself and truly face what you really like but but you're much better off doing it as soon as you possibly can yeah. than than continuing to engage the the unloving behavior that tends, tends to result from a soul that's acting in its addictions yeah. and then of course degrading your final condition like yeah. degrading where you end up spending your a lot of your life unfortunately because it, it, the more degrading it becomes the more difficult it becomes too to get out of that yeah, degradation exactly mm. yeah yeah can't say it enough mm. okay um so fred becomes very overwhelmed and, and yeah. has a cry yeah. and He's coming to his home now, his specific house. Yeah. And my Hanin is showing him around. And Omra comes and says some beautiful words to him mm. about... Um, and remember, he's seen Omra in a completely different role. Yeah. Before, he, he was, before Omra was in this very, very, you know, this very bright spirit doing a ceremony for hundreds and hundreds of people. Now the ceremony is for him mm -hmm. and he's in his, because it's a, uh, a ceremony where Omra is in his formal capacity, yeah. he allows his true brightness to be shown as well. So, so he's, he arrives there in the same formal capacity, yeah. if you like, as he was in the formal capacity of the ceremony. Yes. And this is, a, is, this is in fact another ceremony yeah. for one person, yeah. a, a welcoming for one person. And this is, where, this is where he becomes overwhelmed by the whole experience because it is like this whole ceremony is or orchestrated just for him. And on top of that, this very special person that he's seen before who's come, you know, and obviously has a God-appointed role in other areas, is now presenting him with his, due, you could say, due reward of his yeah. earth-based experience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's very, very beautiful. Um, yeah. yeah, and he throws his arm, Omra throws his arms around Fred and says, welcome our beloved one. In the name of our Father, enjoy thy rest. Mm. So this is a this is signalling that there's going to be some time for more rest and recuperation, really a reflection for yes. Frederick. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so Fred's really overwhelmed and Omra makes him feel quite comfortable and says, wow, look at all your friends. Yeah. That's great. And he says this that I'd like to discuss with mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. My brother, the Lord has promised that they who sow in tears shall reap in joy. Mm. In these, our friends, I wish you to behold the fulfillment thereof. Here you may see so far as it has yet been gathered the harvest of your life's work. 
You went to them bearing seed more precious than you could estimate. And though with a trembling hand and an uncertain knowledge, you scattered it. Still, as the word of God, it accomplished that whereto he sent it. Now your day in the harvest field is over. Your work is done. You return to the God who sent and commissioned you, bringing your sheaves with you. In the name of Christ who redeemed us, I thank you for your ministry of love for inasmuch as you did it to these, ye did it to him, also to him. Mm. Mm. So that's a very moving probably passage for both of us, but um, he's basically saying you did a great deal with what you'd been given mm. and you did it with sincerity and with you did the very best thing that you felt that you could do mm. um, and you stayed true to yourself and this is this is the harvest of that mm. and there's a lot of bibl biblical references in there isn't mm. there so yeah. um, the what you sow you shall reap mm -hmm. uh, reference that I, I can't tell you exactly where it is in the Bible now but it's very famous well it's in a number of different areas yeah. but um, but the principle of it, of course, Paul talked about. But yeah. um, that principle alone is a very important principle in the sense that, and, and I suppose in some ways you could say that we always sow what we reap from a day-to-day -day experience. So, yes. you know, many of us right at this point in time us are reaping what we've sown 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Absolutely. And so, you know, this is a constant thing. But there is, there is something about our passing where you really notice it because, because there is such a contrast in terms of where you can go mm -hmm. or where you're allowed to go in the spirit world, which is very dependent upon what you sowed before that time. So there is a definite uh, feeling when you pass that you are now reaping what you've sown on earth. In other words, your entire collection of what you sow on earth mm -hmm. is now being wrecked or, or being gathered in the spirit world you're, you're you're seeing the results of it and this is where i feel a lot of people would take be a lot more circumspect if with their choices on earth if they knew that that once they have passed that they will reap the rewards or the mm -hmm. the compensatory effects you know that the, the the penalties if you like of what they've sown on earth mm -hmm. and and I feel that while they do that in a day-to-day -day basis while they're on earth, many are not very sensitive to it on earth. Whereas in the spirit world, you are forced into sensitivity to the reaping. Yeah. You, you, you will reap what you have sown on earth. And this is where, why it becomes such a marked time when you first pass, because you are now reaping the direct results of what you have sown. Yeah, it's even more, yeah, as you say, it's it's like right there, here it is. It mm. is a point, if you will, like it's not a judgment point, but it's a point where it's time to take stock. There was that one whole opportunity that God gave you yeah. with a lot of mercy and a lot of experimentation with your free will. Mm -hmm. What happened with that? How'd mm -hmm. you go with that? Mm -hmm. Now now let's look at what you're going to have to deal with from that. From that, yeah. And how you're going to continue to use your will now. Yes, well, obviously that then causes a person to be more circumspect after that point as to how they use their will. And this is why it's very interesting sometimes talking to spirits who have passed is that, that many of them have used their will quite poorly on earth. They pass into the spirit world and many of them are now quite afraid to use their will in that direction any further, which mm -hmm. is understandable. Mm -hmm. They understand that if they use their will further in the negative direction they were using it on earth, then obviously there may be further negative consequences, so they no longer do that. But they're also then quite afraid to make any positive steps because they don't even know what a positive step generally is. They don't understand that it's all based around love and God's viewpoint of love. And, and so they are often very afraid to make any positive steps. And for that reason, many of them stay still. Mm -hmm. They don't do anything. And, uh, and they don't do it because they're afraid yeah. that if they make a positive step, that it might make their si situation more painful and worse. And so this is some, something that we need to work our way through after we've passed generally. And this is why many of the discussions we have with spirits are about helping them make that transition of, you know, this is seeing the relationship between what they did on earth, where they are now in the spirit world, and then of course what they could choose to do in the spirit world, 
and then the results that might come if they chose a more loving direction. Mm. Mm. But it becomes a lot a stronger, a m more strongly known to you once you've passed. On earth, you can be desensitized to it. You can avoid the pain. You can blame everybody else for where you are. You can blame everybody else for your pain. You can blame your husband, your wife, your kids, your father, <laughs> your you know, <laughs> mother, you, you know, yeah. your, your friends, your workmates, your, your companies, the government. You can blame anybody. But in the spirit world, you don't get to do all of that. You, you start to realize that actually where I am right now is the direct result of my personal choices. Yeah. And you don't get to blame everybody anymore. Yeah. And that's a really good thing, actually. But also it's a very, like, in-your-face thing as well. Yeah. A very powerful tool to help you come to, a, to, to some awareness and cognizance of your own responsibility. Mm. Yeah. And... I feel that we are given opportunities to recognise that responsibility all the while that we're on earth. I mean, yeah. God's laws are always trying to show us, hey, you're using your will. Yeah. Hey, look at how your will's affecting things. Hey, yeah. all these things. But then when we pass, it's an even bigger moment, isn't it? Yeah. It's just less deniable, yes. less we, able to you know, make We can bring up many it. illustrations of that. If you look at, like, for example, you look at the issue with disease and, and sickness. Most people on earth blame external factors for disease and sickness. They don't believe that it has anything to do with what their soul is in denial of feeling. Mm -hmm. And as a result, when they, start to, when they pass, they start coming to terms with the fact that actually they have these diseases and sicknesses because of what they chose, not for any other reason. And this is a very, very you know, stark contrast to on earth. On earth, everybody on earth thinks that it's got nothing to do with what you chose and there must be some other reason. <laughs> and, and you can't do that with regard to sickness and disease in the spirit world. So if you have diseased limbs or sicknesses in the spirit world, which you can have, mm -hmm. you, you will find that uh, it'll be very much a reflection of what you've chosen to do, the suppression of what, you, what you've chosen to suppress. And, and so in that process, you start to learn, ah, even on earth, when I, when I had that sickness or I had that illness or I had that disease, that was all the result of what I chose mm -hmm. to suppress. It was my responsibility, my creation. And you start seeing things as your own creations rather than blaming other people for what you've created. Yeah, yeah. Mm. All right, so, so back to this speech that Amra is given really. Mm -hmm. um, something else that struck me about what he's saying to Fred is he's sort of saying that the seed he gave was precious, so in this harvest on earth. And if I consider what Frederick gave or his attitude when he was on earth, mm. as he's pointed out through this story, he really, he really, he knew some things for sure. And that was that the, that the God and the love that the supposed love that he'd encountered through organized religion mm -hmm. and through his family's concepts he had come to the decision that look that's not it mm -hmm. and he had done that for himself so he'd been through this really soul searching process for himself mm -hmm. and he hadn't just sort of blindly followed any kind of doctrine or teaching he said look i've got to figure it out for myself and i know some things are not right so what do i believe is right and I'm going to go out there and do what I can mm. in that direction. Mm. And Omra is saying that was precious what you did. Mm -hmm. That was really, really important. And so it reaped a lot of rewards for other people what you did. Yes. And I think that's a really important thing to reflect on for ourselves personally, that if we blindly follow a teaching or a faith and it's not coming from our heart, if we haven't done our own sort of soul searching about what, what do I really feel and believe and what do I want to do with what I feel and believe, mm. then we can't really be expecting to sow or reap any great harvest mm. as compared to what is possible. Yes. And a lot, and a lot of people do, don't they? They, they follow the crowd. Yeah. Like they, they spend all of their time just following what other people do. Yeah. And, and then they say, oh, those people misled me. Well, no. You, you made some choices there too, you know, yes. and, and this is where I get back to that statement I made earlier about self-responsibility. Once you start, once you pass into the spirit world, your own responsibility for your choices and decisions will be very, very firmly placed before mm -hmm. you. 
in contrast to what you get away with here on earth. Yeah. So my suggestion to people now is you need to start looking at your own responsibilities, what your own responsibilities really are, mm -hmm. and start seeing what you actually create rather than blaming everyone around you for what you create. And because if you don't do that, you'll find when you pass, you'll have some terrible shocks about how things that you thought were other people's fault are actually yours. Yeah. And, and this is why it's very, very important for a person to take personal responsibility for their life. Yeah. And I think, I think we've given some talks already about that, yeah. about taking responsibility yeah, for done. your life. And it's so important for a person to do this as soon as they possibly can. <laughs> and yet we see most people still not choosing to do it. No, and even like, within this, um, this teaching that we're giving, which emphasises personal responsibility, I see that a lot of people want to use terminology they've heard from us uh, and use that as an excuse for bad behaviour. Yeah, terrible behaviour. They're not searching in their heart, what is the emotion driving me in these actions? It doesn't yeah. matter what I call it or how I say, oh, it's what someone else said I should do. Yeah. In the end, I'm responsible for what I do yeah. and nobody else, nobody else. And if you're and sensitive, loving behaviour is quite obvious and yes. unloving behaviour is also yes. quite obvious. And you can't go, oh, well, you know, what, what we see a lot of people doing is using divine truth terminology to justify very unloving behaviour. Yeah. It's not, it's not, that's not the purpose of truth. <laughs> to justify a loving behavior. In fact, the purpose of truth is to expose loving behavior, unloving behavior, and to also demonstrate what loving behavior should be. Mm. Now, the majority of people who are engaging divine truth at this stage are still engaging unloving behavior. They, they, they you know, we've had example today of that, you know, mm -hmm. where one guy emailing you over and over, unsolicited emails over and over and over again, accusing other people of doing unloving things that he himself is actually doing. Yeah. You know, there's an example of another person who basically thinks that they can get away with unloving behaviour and because it's all couched in some kind of terminology that it's all going to be all right with God. No, it's not. No. That unloving behaviour is going to be exposed and the more harmful, the more purposefully harmful you become towards other people, the more difficult your life's going to become, not only now, but also when you pass, because you're going to have to bear the responsibility of those choices. Yeah. Yeah. What I like about Fred is that he understood that even on earth. He understood, I, he, he sort of had this feeling, didn't he? Of, I don't want to do unloving things on earth. I've had enough unloving mm -hmm. things done to me, mm -hmm. particularly from his own father, that, that he didn't want more, you know, to be involved in doing the same things to other people. And as a result, he didn't justify his own unloving behaviour. Now, he might not have been aware of his own addictions and he might not have been aware of all the truths. You know, he had nobody come and explain to him what the truths were, but he at least got that. And as a result of getting that, you examine where, he's, where he passed into. Yep. He passed into a place where the majority of people on earth do not pass into mm -hmm. because they do purposefully engage unloving behaviour and they don't have any desire to repair that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And if we see then uh, after... Omar says this beautiful thing to Frederick. He, he wants to protest and he says, look, honestly, um, I had been most greatly blessed that the ministry to which he referred had been the bright spots in an otherwise most intolerable life, mm -hmm. that the enjoyments which naturally accrued were far more than compensation for any sacrifice it might have demanded. Mm -hmm. While I was painfully conscious of how much I had admitted to do omitted to do mm -hmm. in comparison with the trifle accomplished. Mm -hmm. And I suppose his sentiments demonstrate that really he was serving from a pure place because he, it brought him joy. Mm -hmm. you know, he wasn't doing it just because he thought he should. Mm -hmm. He really did feel like I wanted to do this for other people mm -hmm. and, and therefore it gave me joy and actually it gave me some solace. As you said, he had such unloving treatment around him, it, it felt good to actually be in the company of people who wanted to have this kind of um, communion with him of, of giving and receiving and, and yeah. kindness. Yeah. And I'd probably like to spend a bit more time on that idea of um, if you did it to one of these little ones you've done oh, it to me. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Because I, I forgot that Because part. I just feel yes. like um, 
This is something that I did say in the first century because quite often people would come up to me and say, look, I'd like to do this for you. And I, and I would say to them, look, would you do it for that person over there? And they'd look at that person over there that I'm pointing to and they go, no, I wouldn't do it for them. And I said, well, don't do it for me then mm. because it's not, it's not real. If you, if you wouldn't do it for them, then why are you doing it for me? And if, you, if, you're, doing, if you're doing something for, if, to them, you're already doing it for me. Yeah. And this is something that most people didn't understand. Yeah. They, and this is what I see a lot of people who are listening to Divine Truth doing too. They don't understand some very basic principles about if you, te if you treat one of your other brothers and sisters badly, then that's the same as treating me badly or you badly. It's exact, and, and in my feelings, it's exactly the same. And, and, and I look at that person and I go, hang on a sec, you've just treated that other person over there badly and now you're wanting to treat me nicely. You've got some pretty bad motivations because if you wanted to treat people nicely, you would have treated that person over there nicely and you didn't. Yes. And can we talk about that even deep, more deeply about what you're meaning? Because yeah. I know we both feel really passionately about this. Yeah. If someone has the, capac the capacity to treat someone else badly, then that condition is within them. Of course. It's a, soul, it's a lack of love that exists within them. Yes. And if they then come and treat you well, yep. it's very often because they are wanting something addictively. Of course. Because that soul condition is already there inside of them where they and have a feeling changed. of selfishness or, yeah, yeah. or of demand or whatever the, the condition is that caused the Correct. ill treatment of the other person. Correct. That hasn't gone away just because they're interacting with you. No. And conversely, if someone actually has a condition of love within them, which ca causes within them a desire to serve and be kind and loving to others, then to us that feels like a really beautiful thing because mm. they've implemented some of what we've been trying to teach, Correct. Um, which feels like a gift anyway. But also it shows that that condition is there within them for whoever they interact with. Yes. Uh, so Did I explain that one? Yes. Yeah. So they're, yeah. sincere about, yes, they're, they're sincere. They're sincere about that particular thing being a truthful condition within themselves. Yeah. But I also feel that there's this aspect, isn't there, of how there are, there are many people who believe that they can treat one group of people badly and then treat another group of people well and then somehow get a due reward for such yeah. things. Whereas God is just going to tell them, well, you're a hypocrite. And actually, that's worse than if you just treated everybody badly, because then then you you were more honest. You, you were more honest <laughs> yeah. than you know, yeah. and and, uh, and your motivations for treating people well are obviously driven by some very very poor and unloving motivations, and and this is where I see a lot of people coming unstuck. They believe that their motivations for treating treating one group of people are good. What while the other people, they treat the other group of people badly and they believe their motivations to doing that are good <laughs> as well. Yeah. And, and both can't be the case, actually, and both are not the case. And it's time that people started to look at how they treat everyone, everyone on this planet. Everyone on this planet is your brother and sister. Everyone on this planet is just as important to God as any other person on this planet is. And also, by the way, anyone in the spirit world is just as important to, to everyone, to God, as to any, as anyone else is. Mm -hmm. So that means that when you treat one of your brothers and sisters badly, for whatever reason you give, God, from God's perspective, it means nothing. You've treated one of God's children badly, and you are going to have to bear the responsibility and also the Re you'll reap the reward, or you could say in this case, you'll reap the penalty of what yeah. you've done. And you can't then go and use, you know, divine truth terminology or some other religious terminology, you know, some Christian terminology or some Muslim terminology or some new age philosophy or something to justify your unloving behavior. Because at the end of the day, God doesn't look at all of that terminology and go, oh, yes, because that terminology <laughs> makes sense to me. You know, it's like, not like a judge in the, in the court where yeah. if you cite a some past, kind of legal, past legal precedent. precedence or something. Yeah. God's just going, no, you treated that person unlovingly. You obviously had motivations for doing so. Look at those motivations for doing so. And if you don't, then, of course, I can't engage with you and give you further gifts. And, and I see 
the same with people treat, like with us that like we they do this with us all the time it's a there's a wide range of ways we get treated isn't there like mm -hmm. we get treated really badly by some people like like violently abusively you know where they you know they're you know constantly uh, deg trying to degrade us and pull us down and all those kind of things you get that kind of treatment all in the name of whatever their religious faith is or what or whatever their belief is and i go to those people you have learned nothing about love nothing about love do you think you're going to get away with that treatment even if you think that i'm not jesus and i deserve that treatment do you think you're going to get away with it definitely not because because God does not allow that treatment of anyone. None of God's laws do. So, so there's, you know, there's one. God allows it, but doesn't allow it without penalty. Well, there's Is no, it? that's yeah. what I mean. God doesn't yeah. allow it. We, 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 I can't, uh, yeah, I think my original statement Sorry. is correct. Yeah. Like, God does not allow it. Yeah. The, the, you know, of, of course, you know, we can do it because God's given us free will. But, but from God's perspective, there is a, penalty for, for every action taken like that. Yeah. So, so on the other hand, we see people treating us like as if we're special when they treat other people badly. And we go to them, what's wrong with you? Don't you get love? <laughs> like, don't you understand? You can't do that. You can't treat us well. And then we often get people treating us well until they hear something from us and then they treat us badly. <laughs> you know, what caused you to change in your treatment? Well, ah, because you heard some truth. Well, that doesn't seem to be a very logical reason for now treating somebody badly, right? Really to be not. angry with them or upset with them. So we see this wide range of people. And then you get the people who are really just sincere with everyone. Mm -hmm. And they're just beautiful people. And, and, and people like that, I feel, are the people that I was talking about mostly in the first century who, who I felt that if they did it to anyone, it's like, for me, it's the same as if they did it to me. Yeah. And this is how God feels too, I'm very sure, because when you become at one with God, this is how you feel. That if somebody treats you badly, it's the same as treating anybody else badly. Mm -hmm. If somebody treats you nicely, it's the same as treating anyone else nicely. If somebody treats anyone else nicely, it's the same as treating you nicely yeah. and vice versa. If they treat yeah. somebody else badly, it's the same as treating you badly. And what I see happening for most people is there is a huge amount of hypocrisy on this issue. Most people do not want to treat other people well mm -hmm. in all circumstances and situations under all pressures. Yeah. They don't. And as a result, there is going to be, they're going to have to bear the responsibility of their choices and decisions in that regard. And that is a sign of true soul development. When mm. we desire to do that, regardless of what the external pressures might be, regardless yes. of even the personal pain we might encounter. Even if our life's being threatened, yeah. even if our children's lives are being threatened, even if we have nothing to eat, mm -hmm. even if we have nothing to wear, even if we had nothing to drink, even we uh, under no circumstances is there any justification for unloving behaviour. Yeah. And, and I find it quite surprising that even the people who have listened to divine truth for a period of time and then have gone away all angry and bitter and twisted because I've said something to them that's been truthful in most cases, well, pretty much all the cases I can remember anyway, and they haven't got that very basic principle about love. Mm -hmm. And the basic principle is you would not do that to somebody if you loved. Yeah. If you truly loved, you wouldn't do that. And if all development is about love, then you're already out of harmony with true development. Mm. And I feel one of the things this book has shown is that true, all development is about love. Yes. Again and <laughs> again and again, love. it's yeah. been said and, um, and yeah. demonstrated. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, gosh, that was a really good thing to talk about. <laughs> 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 All right. So let's now talk about the home yeah. that Frederick finds that he has really created through the use of his will. Yes. Um, and perhaps if I just read a part of this. Shall I read so, the par paragraph maybe where it says... I wish I could, yeah. yes. I wish I could find words to convey even a faint idea of the beauty and completeness of that house. But if I attempted it, it would fail even at the outset. So that must pass. But there is one matter to which I must refer because of its serious import to those still in the flesh. Jesus Christ, speaking of the many mansions in his father's house, said to his disciples, I go to prepare a place for you. 
But what about the furnishing thereof? This is a thought which had never once crossed my mind until I entered my new abode. Then another great revelation was made to me. Every article of furniture, ornament or decoration was most vividly associated with, as though it had been manufactured from, some act, word or feature of my earth life. It was a terrible truth to learn how I wished I had known it earlier. Mm. Yeah, and that is really demonstrating uh, what we've been referring to yes. all the way through this So discussion. now he has in his home a direct reminder of all of the good things that he did mm -hmm. and also all of the negative things he did. Yeah. Everything yeah. is all being reminded in the, exact, in the exact place where he lives. And this is where, as we were saying earlier, on earth, while we still have a physical body, there's lots of ways that God is trying to, through the laws that operate upon us, show us, hey, this is where you went wrong. And mm. even the pangs on our conscience and all of those things are our soul working mm. to try and help us rectify the issues of out, that are out of harmony with love and to strengthen the ones that are yeah. uh, all the way through our life. But this is where now the physical manufacturing of our home is actually it is made of these things so mm. there is just it's a there's far fewer ways to avoid save never entering our home mm -hmm. um, entering our home there it all is yeah. laid out yeah every um, record of everything we've done yeah. Whether we like it or not, it's yeah. all there on the walls. Yes. Yeah, well, in the, the next perhaps... The record of it is for everyone <laughs> to see who comes and visits us, yes. as well as ourselves, because yes. we live in our own home. Yeah. Uh, we have a record every single day, every single moment in our home is a reminder of every single thing that we've done. <laughs> and isn't that... like? Let's think about that if we did that in our, in our earth homes. Like At the moment, in most people's homes, you enter the home and... There's photos on the wall. This is our wedding day. This is the yeah. birth of our first child. This is our grandkids. <laughs> this is our wedding anniversary. This is when we went on holiday to Hawaii. These yeah. are all these things. Imagine if we had, a, oh, and this is our first major huge fight in yeah. our marriage. And this is where we had the car crash. And yeah. this is, it, it would be. And this my, is where I cheated on my wife. And yes. this is where she cheated on me back because she was upset about me cheating on her. And this is where, you know, yeah. this is where I had a child from them cheating on the wife. And, yeah. you know, this is where I, you <laughs> Here know, it this, all is. this is. Well, where I ripped off my neighbour and my friend, and this is where I stole my next door neighbours. This is where I lied to my boss <laughs> seven times about being sick when I really wasn't, or whatever yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah, and it goes on. Yeah. So imagine if we lived our lives that way on earth. Yeah. It would be. It would probably be much more beneficial for us, wouldn't we? We'd probably be less invested in having a facade and and hopefully uh, more real with our interactions with everyone, yeah. including ourselves. And, you know, let, letting go of facade and being really real about what is happening, it connects us more. The, yeah. One of the reasons I've decided that we have facade is not just because of how I want you to feel about me, it's how I want not to, to feel, about, feel about me. Most, the story I want to tell myself about myself. Yeah, that's the main reason why yeah. you have a facade. It's got yeah. nothing to do with what you show everyone else. It's got mostly to do with what you want to believe about yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. why you create it. <laughs> <laughs> and so Fred, in one of the rooms, contained a series of pictures giving the record to which Omra had referred. Mm. At a glance, I could see the result was by no means perfect. The original design, in every case perfectly visible, was always more or less spoiled in equally apparent errors. And so this is great, isn't it? This is where Fred's now beginning his whole journey of... Yeah. understanding his errors. Yeah. And, and he's like he says, in them I could easily detect the weaknesses I still laboured under and the numerous defects which would need to be remedied before I could reach that higher link of life from the view of which I had just returned. Yeah. And I think that's super cool in yeah. that he's just been saying, I want to get to that place. And he enters a home that says, well, here's the <laughs> Here's all the reasons why you're not there. <laughs> yeah, and here's what you need to work on. Yeah. And in a way, you know, one of the points for reflection I had at the end of this chapter was to, for people to think about um, 
this very thing that Fred's home is designed perfectly for him to see what he needs to remedy. Yeah. And how often do we actually resent in our earth life being shown our errors through our physical body and our environment and our yeah. finances and all of those things? A lot of times we resent those things when actually it's a it's a it's the same workings yeah. to a less yeah. in your face degree, but it's the yeah. same thing. Happening. Exactly. Yeah. And and if we all engaged our life very differently we'd probably be a lot more in, you know, we'd find the whole process a lot more enjoyable because it's like, it's like every, God through the law of attraction, which is really what this law is all about. The law of attraction is bringing to us every event that's showing us what is wrong yeah. and what is right yeah. in our life. Yeah. And if we're sensitive to it, we'd, we'd be going, ah, there we go. There we go again. Thank you. The, oh, isn't this wonderful? Yes. <laughs> now I see it. If I want to get to that really great place, this is what I'm going to have to fix up. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a wonderful, wonderful opportunity yeah. that God gives us. And so even, even though we might not have any person helping us to see what truth is, our very life, if we're sensitive to it, our very life will demonstrate the exact truth of where we really are. Yeah. And this is, what I, this is why I find, this is one thing I find a lot very sad too about most people when they analyse their own life. They want to blame everyone else for where they are. And it's such a terrible thing to do because it takes away any power for you to change your life. Yeah. You, know, you need to do the opposite. You need to go, okay, where I am right now, I've got to have a good look at what's going on around me, what's going on for me, what I'm creating, because these are, I'm, I'm the central figure in this life, so there's something I'm creating here. Absolutely. Yeah. And it might not be all as negative as you think. Either. No, that's right. And I yeah. think a lot, of, a lot of people hear this and they go, oh no, what am I going to see? When actually it doesn't have to be that bad. Yeah. And maybe if we give an illustration, like if you're getting attacked all the time, it doesn't mean that you're worth being attacked all the time. What it means is that you are open to attack. Yeah. There is something inside of you that accepts the attack of others and, and it's a soul-based thing that you need to heal. And you're not going to heal it by attacking them back. You're not going to heal it by having a big cry about the fact that you're getting attacked all the time. You need to heal it by finding the real reason why this allowance exists yes. within your soul. And, and this is what we need to, to do, like in yeah. that one example. Yeah. And like we need to look at that with regard to every aspect of our life. Yeah, and, and this thing that you said earlier about being sensitive, what I am notice is that when we start to work on an issue and it's sort of we just that's really us deciding to be more sensitive to yeah. that same issue yeah um we be i we just begin to see how much we're attracting why messages if you like in the form of interactions yeah. to show us to help us through that issue yeah i mean i I can see that in my life all of the time where and it's not even things that you would call it's not conflicts or even disturbances in my life it's just oh there's another interaction mm. with that gender that I did that in yeah. oh there's another one oh there's yeah. another one and and these are all routine and run of the mill ones mm. and now that I'm becoming sensitive to it here's all these messages that you yeah. know that are there yeah. for me yeah. yeah okay okay so so now we come to the very last <laughs> the very last event I suppose the very so. last event yeah um and that is that um fred enters his home and there's one doorway with the curtains closed and he yeah. feels quite anxious about going through, the doorway. through the doorway <laughs> and mahanin shows him the rest of the house and then he says now i'm going to go yeah and Fred realises what's on the other side of the curtain. And isn't it wonderful that Maya Yin just says, okay, no, this is, there are private moments. Yeah. And there's, there's moments in your life that, that no one else can really understand. No one else is really going to be able to connect to because they're your feelings, your, you know, something, something that's personally gone on in your life that only has happened to you yeah. and not happened to anybody else. And there's, there's, moments in your life where you come across those kind of moments and you really need to have time alone with them and it's wonderful that all of his spirit friends are so sensitive to that and just yeah. let him have his time alone with this last moment yeah because yeah. <laughs> he needs to have the time alone he does and he even leaves the 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 story yeah, he says yeah. this is my private moment and yeah. and he basically that he that he found himself in 
the embrace of his mum, yeah. his mother. So he met his mum. Who had died at his birth. Yeah, so he basically met his mum seemingly for the first time. For the first time. <laughs> yes, but there's another book and yeah, we'll learn course, more about yeah. that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that wraps up our story. Mm. I had some reflection questions sure. just for, for sure. our for viewers the, for to think everyone, yeah. about. Uh, and just briefly, we've probably c commented on the majority of these. One was about that Fred had learned so much because he asked questions. Yes. And you and, and he I had sincere questions. It wasn't just doubting, yes. fear-based questions driven by a desire or a need to get some approval or attention or some other reason. They were all sincere, yes. every single one of them. And I suppose my reflection questions for our viewers revolve around that. How often do you ask with a sincere feeling of, I don't know? Yeah. <laughs> and to notice how many times you're asking questions when you actually have a preconceived notion that you're trying to prove mm. or because you feel afraid or angry or threatened. Or, by, doubt, or, or doubtful. doubtful yeah. Which is really just fear yeah. disguised as yeah. something else. Yeah. Um, so to think about those things and notice that in your life because if we learn anything from Fred's example, it is that he... He discovered so much truth about God, the universe, his whole, the meaning of existence, yeah. about repentance, forgiveness, everything. He learnt it because he really had a sincere seeking feeling in his heart that led his questions. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's the first point. Yeah. <laughs> Very good point for self-reflection. Yes. Um, the second one was about Fred's home being the per perfect for his condition. Yes. And designed to help him actually see his errors. Yes. And so reflection for people at home is to think about the fact that this is already happening here on earth, mm. perhaps to in a less obvious way to you before you really want to notice it. But, yeah, but once, it once you real. start noticing it, it's very obvious. Exactly. Once you notice it, it's very obvious. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so to think about how much you're begrudging those things that are actually there to help you see your errors and actually grow in love yeah. and how you have a different choice yeah. involved in those things. Yes. And, and, and other, are, you, are you personally aware? Like, yes. are you, do you even want to be aware? Yeah. Or, or are you spending most of your time trying to ignore yeah. what you're creating? Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Wanting to be in denial about it. Yeah. The third point was about sowing and reaping. Mm -hmm. And it really speaks to something that you said earlier about the fact that right now we are reaping the harvest of what we did, said, thought, believed ye five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Yes. So the first thing for people to reflect on if they choose to is to reflect on what is the harvest of my life right now mm -hmm. and what were those things in the past that have driven this harvest because that's really important stuff for us to see. Well it's important because it's, uh, they are the issues that will help us to become repentant for like at the end of the day if we want to engage the laws of love properly we're going to need to learn repentance yeah. and to learn repentance you've got to look at what you've done in the past and see the results of what it's creating now yeah. and ask yourself like why did you do that? Exactly. Why did you make the choices you made? And you have the the choice to repent for that. Yep. And then the next part of the question is to think about what am I sowing right now? Mm. What decisions am I making? And what fear based what decisions am I making in order to avoid fear when I'm acting in fear? Yeah. Because that is in effect sowing even more seeds yeah. in a harvest that is that not going to work out well yeah. and it's i'm for telling the future, you yeah. it's for yeah. the future so yeah. the decisions we're making today don't just affect tomorrow no. they affect long the term. relationships the content of our life yeah. in five years in 10 years in 15 years so yeah. and we really see a lot of that. people don't we making decisions now they hear divine truth and then they make some very bad decisions, Yes. very bad decisions. Yeah. They make very bad decisions with their family, with their friends, with the way in which they practice their life, with, if, you know, they don't make decisions based on love and truth any, at all. Yeah. They, make, they make often very angry and, yeah. and negative choices and decisions. And of course, you're not going to get very good results from that. No way. And, and <laughs> what can you expect? You can't expect any you different with God's laws. You can't expect any different. And, <laughs> and can I say that since I met you again, I've been faced with many, many decisions. Yeah. 
Now, some of those, some decisions I feel glad. I made decisions based on principles surrounding love yeah. and truth and yeah. what I believe to be the most loving towards myself and others at the times that I've made those decisions. Yeah. Now, what I want to say for our viewers is the next day, I didn't necessarily think, woohoo, I sowed something really awesome. I've grown a great harvest. But five years down the track, yeah, yeah I've changed. I feel better. I feel like the harvest is better and the, mm. this, the quality of my life in those areas is much better. Yeah. Then there's been other areas where I've continually acted in my fear. I've made decisions based in fear. Yeah. And because of that, five years later, it's the, actually worse. It's worse. Yeah. It's worse. And yeah. this, is, this is why I wanted to ask everyone to take the opportunity to reflect on this sowing and reaping because yeah. very often when we're caught up in fear or in anger or whatever, rebellion, whatever is going on for us. Mm, particularly the rebellion. Yeah, right rebellion's now. a good one, isn't it? Because <laughs> you can do some very nasty things in rebellion. You can. And very and nasty things in anger. You can be covertly rebellious and yes. covertly angry and yeah. this is where it takes the sincerity to see what's really inside your heart yeah. for yourself what's driving your actions but you can sort of say oh no i'm just being independent but really the feeling is rebellion yeah. or no no i just have to speak the truth but really the feeling is rage yeah. and those decisions we are sowing something that is not going to lead to a good harvest no. um no. and we have this decision right now to change what we're sowing yeah. and so i feel like it's just a a powerful reflection process to go through with yes. your journal yeah. over a period of weeks you know to look at this sewing. For most people, I'd suggest it's years. <laughs> well, I nearly said months, but perhaps years. Um, <laughs> never give it up. Yeah. <laughs> These well, you, you know, of course, when you become at one with God, you don't need to worry about all those things because you've resolved them. But before that time, if you're really sincere, you're going to have to go through this process of taking responsibility for your life. Yeah. And that's about coming to face to face with your own choices, whether they were loving or not. Yeah. And And a lot of people ask us, why is my life so hard now? Well, a lot of times it's hard because of the choices you previously made. Yeah. And you go, you know, you've got to take the consequence of the choice you've previously made. And this is not about regret, is it? This is about responsibility mm -hmm. and repentance. Yeah. And the recognition that we can make different choices. Yes. So and also it, it should give us enough pause the next time we make a decision. If, if, we've, if we've fully taken responsibility for a choice we made in the past and we realise, wow, that really created a lot of hardship in my life over the last two or three years by making that particular choice, when we're faced with a similar decision now, surely if we've learnt the lesson, we would make a different choice. Yeah. Right? And, I, and quite frequently, that's not what we do. Because we, again, haven't learnt the lesson. No, we no. haven't actually learnt the soul-based lesson. Exactly. We think we have, but we haven't. Yeah. And, and very, sorry. And the only way it's going to change is that real soul progression has to occur. Yeah. That's the only way it's going to change. And that can only occur when we stop blaming, stop feeling like we're a victim, yeah. stop saying it wasn't in my hands, that yeah. I didn't have a choice. It's when we take responsibility of the free, for the free will choices that we have made. Correct. And that's the only time it's going to shift. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And this is something that I feel like the beauty of Fred's first book is that he's basically saying, look, my life is on earth was a bit of a mix up. I didn't really know where I was. Yeah. I didn't really know where I was going, but I knew some basic things about love. And so what I chose to do was I chose to engage them. I chose to engage them in a very basic rudimentary manner in what, I, what he now sees mm -hmm. as a very basic rudimentary manner. But he bore the benefit of that yeah. in that he didn't have to arrive in the spirit world in the hells or, you know, or be terrified to even go to the spirit world, you know, yeah. and so remain earthbound. And, and the reason why he didn't bear that consequence is because he had learnt enough about love to know when to treat somebody nicely, yeah. at least. Yes. And, and he tried to treat people nicely. A yeah. And this is what I see. This is where the majority of people who hear Divine Truth are making huge mistakes. Yes. They can't even treat somebody nicely after hearing Divine Truth for five years. Yeah. There's something wrong there. Yeah. You know, if you can't treat somebody nicely after hearing Divine Truth for five years, 
then you, you've got some very, very bad problems with self-responsibility, with truly seeing yourself as you really are. Mm -hmm. you, you've got some issues you've got to resolve yeah. because, because this is one of the most fundamental principles of God's truth yeah. and one of the most fundamental principles about having a relationship with God. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Okay, final point for reflection was about Fred meeting his mother. Yeah. And he's, he wonders how different his life might have been had he received genuine maternal love. Um, on earth. On earth. Mm. He wonders how his life might have turned out if he had have had that. And just really the question was what emotions does that stir up for you as the reader, mm -hmm. that sentiment um, about receiving real love from a mother mm -hmm. uh, a lot of us or are, a father for that matter or a father <laughs> but yes just because it was about mm. a mother uh, in this in this part of the book but well um, it's interesting for Fred isn't it because his mother passed when he was born and so he missed his mother yes if his father had passed when he was born he yeah. might have missed his father yes and not known what it was like to have, have a father now of course his father didn't pass and his father was a you know, he wasn't a very nice man. He was he was a hypocrite, a religious uh, hypocrite as well, and also a material hypocrite. And and so you know, Fred didn't have much love for him. Mm -hmm. But if his mum remained on earth, when you know before yeah. he passed, and and didn't you know she never passed, you know, except for dying from natural causes, um, he might have had a completely different experience. In, in that his mum was driven by fear. She only had a relationship with his, her, her, his father because of fear. So if she had remained on earth, there's highly likely she would have taught him to fear women, Absolutely. you know, and, and to do whatever a woman wanted. Yeah. And so, you know, this is the thing is you, you know, you, you look at situation and circumstances and you can't always guess what would have happened. No. Not at all. No. And that's why I just said he wonders about what it would be like. Of course. And it's really a question for the viewer to wonder what it would be like if you received pure yeah. maternal love. Or, mater or, or fraternal love. Oh, like both. Yeah. Yes. Both forms of love. Parental love. Yes. Let's say parental yes. love. Um, because... Well, there's lots I could say about that, but perhaps let's just <laughs> leave it at that. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I agree with you. Um, it's not to say that he would have received that had she been on earth. Correct. But a lot of us have varying feelings about the love or lack thereof that we receive from our parents. Yes. And so it's really just to... And in fact, we need to feel about those things. Yes. Yeah. Hence the question. Yeah. 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 Cool. All right. Good day. Well, that's the end that's of it. our first book. As I, I would recommend to everybody who ever looks at these books is to read them over and over again. And this is why I've read, no, I think I've read this one 17 or 18 times. And, and the reason why is you will find whenever there's a book that presents truth to you, you'll read it again and there'll be more truth that you didn't realize you, that you realized that you lost last time or you didn't somehow get it last time. You weren't open to, you weren't it, open to it last time. And then you read it again and a few months later and you go, wow, there's another truth. And to be frank, if a person does that, then it in indicates generally that there's, a, there's, a, there's growth of some kind occurring. Mm -hmm. If a person reads the same book again and again and doesn't have any new revelations and it's a book with so much revelation in it, yeah. then I suggest to you you're not growing at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And look, um, thank you so much for joining me for My the pleasure. discussions in the latter part of this book. And the first it's, 13 or so chapters were all done with a group as well. With a group, yeah. yeah so we can thank all of those thank attendees. Thank all of those people who came to those groups and for your participation. And I really valued the discussion that we were able to have and the, the willingness that people showed to have their personal reflections and reflect on what it meant, the lessons that we were seeing in the book, what it meant in their lives. I mm. really think that's a precious thing to develop. Yeah. It's something that I do constantly as I'm reading and looking at truth. Um, and I really enjoyed having those discussions with people. I also felt like I learned a lot about myself and how to be in front of a group and uh, not be in my addiction when I'm sharing truth with yeah. other people or discussing truth with other people. And so I value that very much, that opportunity that you all gave me for yeah. that. So, yeah. And I've loved having these discussions with you. Yeah, who knows, we might get started on the next book. I would love to do the next book. <laughs> and um, 
I, I also have a dream of doing a study guide mm -hmm. for, for each of the books so that people can read the chapter, look at a glossary of the unusual words that might have been in the chapter, have a look at the various themes, do some journal work, personal reflection work on what's in each chapter. So that's a project that I'll be working on in all my free time that <laughs> doesn't exist at the moment. <laughs> but yeah. at some point in the future, I'd love to do that as yeah. well. Yeah. But hopefully these discussions that we've had will prove to be beneficial. Yeah, uh, so hopefully you've enjoyed them too. Yeah, I hope you have. Thanks very much, everyone. You Thank you, darling. <laughs>